Hi everyone, welcome to an hour with Law Sikho. This is Ramanuj Mukherjee from IPDs and Law Sikho dot com, and with me I have Aruna Chawla, who is uh, a young lawyer advocate as well as an entrepreneur, and she has been doing some really interesting work around art and fashion law. and uh, she believes that in india art and fashion law is going to be a major area of work in the future and today she is going to share her experience of working in this domain and uh, also like what like how she sees like what what kind of clients are there and you know whether you can actually have a career in art and fashion law so welcome aluma how are you doing thank you ramanu i'm doing very well thanks so much for having me on air today with you Okay, so tell me about this area of art and fashion law. How did you get started, and what exactly have you been doing? So, Ramanuj, uh, essentially, people mistake it and think that art and fashion law is a completely new area of law. That's not how it works. Art and fashion is only an industry wherein law plays, like sports law, which is not a new area of law. It's an industry where we've started. Seeing how various legal aspects and various different laws can come together and enhance an industry, and that's the same case with art and fashion. How I got into this was I was uh, not enjoying law school much. I knew I really liked fashion and styling, but I wanted to make good use of my career as well and of whatever I'd studied. And that's when I started deciding to, you know, maybe look at art and fashion from a legal perspective. Um, five years ago, this blog called the Fashion Law dot com started by another legal uh, aspirant based out of United States, and this young lawyer, come advocate, who is now a lawyer, in fact, started writing about the fashion industry from a legal perspective. And I started realizing that you know maybe there is a lot more of fashion and art that I could contribute to, given my education and given my passions. And that's how I started getting into art and fashion as a lawyer. is it really possible in india to uh, you know have a career so um given that you know we have the second largest population in the world people mistakenly think that maybe fashion law is about just luxury but everybody wears clothes you know and everybody has it's not can fashion you hear is me? yes i can can you hear me hello can you hear me hello Hello can you hear me Hello I'm not to bank it will have to, have to probably dis
Hi, are you? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. So I will start the broadcast now. It is yeah. working better. Okay. Okay. Okay, Aruna, are you able to hear me and see me clearly? Yes. Great. So finally, it's working. I think. So I was saying that you know, in India, basically, we are having a really uh, fast-growing fashion industry because mm -hmm. actually, our the size of our fashion and art industry is really like really really small compared to. uh more advanced economies and the developed countries because you know uh, perhaps the indian consumer did not have uh like you know uh, money which was quite you know they they, they could spend on on discretionary things like art and fashion but now it is changing and as india is getting richer there is a lot of money in this sector and as the industries themselves grow it is understandable that it is getting more attractive for lawyers it is becoming more organized so to speak that they will consider now having lawyers in place uh, so in your experience what sort of work have you been getting so um ramanuj about what you spoke about let me divide these into two the fashion and the art industry as two completely different industries with regards to a growing economy like india we have one of the biggest labor uh aruna are you there hello i think we have lost aruna again <laughs> yeah 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 i can see you and hear you now we lost you in the middle yeah i there's so much technical issue happening where we'll make do with this so again going back to the fashion industry as a you know a developing economy and as a labor intensive economy we in fact have one of the biggest workforces working in the fashion industry it's not that just the people customers who buy the big brands form part of this fashion industry most of the fast fast fashion uh, sweatshops are in india we sub, we we export a lot of cloth material outside we uh for all these big fashion brands that get sold in europe and the united states and all the bigger economies they are being made in india so in terms of labor fashion does have one of the biggest in uh, industries based out of india and other developing countries in fact with regards to human rights concerns also fashion has one of the biggest impact on human rights given that 170% of the people working in the fashion industry in terms of creation of fashion products are women and second the condition of most of these sweatshops have been really poor which is what led to the rana dhaka incident of 2012 and eventually led to organizations like fashion revolution coming up and working towards a more transparent fashion industry and this resulted not in terms of just you know expression of fashion in terms of intellectual property which comes much later but from a very basic human right condition concern of adequate labor practices uh, fair wages that should be paid to these people or the kind of material we're using and the environmental impact of this fashion with regards to art uh definitely our country is booming in terms of people starting to look at art from in, from an investment point of view as well uh one thing that we should remember is we just we got independence 72 years ago we just celebrated our independence day yesterday a lot of coveted art pieces which mm -hmm. are of an investment value don't have uh don't have say bills for example because these are heritage pieces that have been given ahead to their children and in terms of pa a partition happening or a, a government completely changing that has led to a lot of these art pieces losing their value since you cannot go back and trace their origins but definitely in terms of artists like raja ravi verma or amrita shergill or mf husain these are one a lot of big established names but a lot of new year newer artists are coming ahead we look also look at art not just from an investment perspective but also from a societal development perspective there are colleges like srishti school of art and technology doing great work in terms of how they are presenting art forms uh, in the newer for the newer generations technology has been such a big benefit that art like digital art forms of graphic designing illustrations animated movies these are things we don't even look at from a regular art perspective but this is what art is as well 
Sure. So, uh, what, like, like, where are the opportunities arising in terms of uh, lawyers doing legal work? Where are the where are the maximum opportunities in these sectors? For, for fashion, let me list out from the start of the fashion. Uh, you know, from the chain, the first thing where it starts is of a big brand. Say, for example, giving a consignment to a factory uh, to produce their, you know, uh, to produce their. commodities so there are licenses that are made for a design that is sent to this vendor so that you know copying of the uh, of these designs does not happen outside the scope of employment labor conditions within these factories and a lot of international human rights organizations are already working in it so from a labor perspective and from an intellectual property perspective even in the when you start the creation of the supply chain these things uh, lawyers do have an opportunity then if you look at things like fashion shows uh, uh, opportunity is there to give model release forms or working condition of models or photographers licensing their photographs or copy copyright of fact i mean there is no copyright of fashion design per se but there are a lot of intellectual property concerns and also ethical moral concerns which come when we talk about copying of fashion design which is what uh platforms like diet sabya in india and diet prada across the world are working on um in terms of say for example third party distribution where a lot of these big brands have filtered down stores in various different countries there are third party distribution systems that happen and all the vendor agreements that end up happening there so essentially this is a proper industry that's working in it's just that there are some specific nuances specific to the fashion industry that's all it works like any other industry for that matter and has sure. all concerns coming in with regards to art definitely there's a lot more intellectual property concern happening because right now as an economy and as a society we've we've just started looking at art from the perspective of you know protecting somebody else's work a lot of times we don't even realize we'll click up we'll see a really cool picture on our instagram or facebook screenshot it and post it back is but that is copyright infringement of somebody's work as well going ahead that a lot of freelancers and you know digital nomads because that's what technology has blessed us with today still need to learn how to use basic contracts for their freelance work that has to happen or if you go ahead further you when you look at cultural property in in work in situations of war or in situations of any kind of disaster the first thing to do go is cultural and intellectual property and art and and all these forms of art and culture so if there is a uh, a war happening in syria their monuments are going away their temples are being destroyed and this is art and cultural property being destroyed and as lawyers there's a lot of scope of work in these areas as well great so uh, if you can tell me a little bit about uh, you know this fake uh, issue like there's a lot of uh, fashion fake it's like literally like you know it's a it's a thing that you know it's a people go and look for fake so and so fake sabya sachi or fake some other famous uh, you know designer so how is this uh, and also like you know you have fake dior and like every other uh, every brand you have fakes and the markets are flooded with cheap fakes so how does brands deal with it and do lawyers play a role here like how are how how do you prevent this kind of infringement of copyright and designs and uh what is what what are the in the like industries how how is industry dealing with this right now so from a legal perspective if you have a production of 50 or above products of a single design there is no copyright that exists even in terms of fashion because we see it as a functional product and not as a but- uh, an ornamental product there is no copyright that exists however from an industry sta- standpoint creativity needs to be encouraged right so and which is why copyright right like if i create a design unique design even if there is no design right there should be some copyright on it correct correct on the design yes but if you convert it into a fashion commodity for use if it's if it's been created above 50 pieces then that copyright ceases to exist in terms of production of that design which is what will more than 50 pieces i think a lot of times are like very exclusive brands do even like you know especially designer brands it will be less than 50 pieces then correct so that so couture like that see it exists from a legal perspective i'm saying that a copyright wouldn't exist in that situation and of course this infringement of 
you know the this fakes that keep coming in what essentially happens is that they lower the brand value which is yeah. why say for example 3 weeks ago burberry had about 38 million dollars of extra stock for the previous years instead of giving it out in the market they chose to burn it and it had a lot of environmental impact as well of course and a lot of resources get wasted but essentially the idea of intellectual property ends up being about your brand value right and this is what the brands look at so if their brand value is not being impacted they wouldn't really bother from a sociological perspective we should also be thinking about the fact that not everybody can afford designer wear sabya sachi or a christian dior or a christian louboutin is can be you know from pockets of a very few people but everybody wants to wear good clothes right and what happens in copying clothes is also that you can't really go to a tailor in a small town who's been shown a picture of a sabya sachi design and tell him that oh my god i will sue you for infringement of my design even though sabya sachi has a trademark what is doing there is a really like a large uh, you know business around this like people of course there is of course there is and from i mean from a le- from a strictly legal perspective you need to curb it of course i'm not i'm not justifying it i'm saying from a sociological perspective given the kind of share of resources that we have in the world in terms of monetary share as well not everybody is going to be able to afford designer wear and that is when you start having a black market for the fakes because people want to wear good clothes but they can't maybe afford it so what do you do in that case and so i'll give you a small example sabya sachi recently has got like last year he got a trademark for his designs which meant that the banarsi designs that he has are essentially his trademark but stella mccartney what she did was get a geographical indicator for a community product that she was working on with in mexico and presented this on the runway she essentially gave back to that smaller community as well and because it was a geographical indicator the price of those products made by that community outside stella mccartney's brand would be much lower and much more affordable for people so it's realizing that fashion is about revolution fashion is about you know expressing your identity and also about how the society moves forward and how as fashion designers the bigger fashion designers especially can give back to these smaller communities is extremely important for us to consider as lawyers i don't think we should just stick to the what the letter says especially for industries like fashion and art where there are no regulations in any case so as people who are still working in the area of making these policies happen we should be looking at a more empathetic way of making sure that everybody enjoys a share sure so uh, you know what are the things that you really need, uh, need to be good at as a law in a, as a lawyer you have to have skills in those areas of law to be an effective uh, lawyer in this industry like you said this is not a new law this Correct. combination of uh, you know maybe ip law contract law uh, dispute resolution so what are the what are the different areas labor law also from what you what you are saying labor law is important so what are the different areas of law one has to know well to make a impact in this area or have a good career in this area i think it's extremely important of course to know the law really well you can't break the rules unless you know them really well you know so even to develop how labor laws work in a specific industry like fashion you need to know how labor laws work and given that this is an international industry and it's all interconnected it's extremely important to know how the international scenario works in all of these Uh, whether it's labor whether it's intellectual property or contracts or dispute resolution it's an international game that's happening all the brands small or big have because of technology can reach anywhere in the world today so there is nothing stopping that so it's extre- definitely extremely important to know the law really well second i think it for fashion of course it's extremely important to know how the supply chain works because when we look at fashion we just look at okay there is this we have a brand and we've seen it in stores or we've seen it online the models are wearing it the influencers on our instagram are wearing it we will purchase it and that's it but that's not how it is that's a very very small part of how the fashion industry works behind that is a lot of work that the designers are doing that the marketing people are doing the branding people are doing the supply chain in uh, third world countries supplying to the bigger brands that's happening with regards to art a keen interest in arts important i think for no, me no, that is fine like arun i was asking like you know what are the legal skills one need to be to be successful in this area 
I understand there's a lot behind behind the scenes in terms of what is going on. But as a lawyer, what if I want to be a lawyer in this area? What are the skills that I should develop to succeed? Is that that to, what? To start off with, extremely important to know contracts really well, to know labor laws really well, and to know intellectual property really well. Especially because in areas of fashion, intellectual property plays differently, not like the regular industries that we understand. Uh, once you have these skills in place, it's important to know the industry well, and it's only then you can start developing. But regardless, it's important to know the industry and keep be continuing to creatively apply the letter of the law and seeing how best you can make an impact on it. Because there, all the see, all these laws are applicable in any case to any industry, and especially with fashion, which is why knowing the industry really well is only going to assist any lawyer working in this industry know how the actual industry works well, or how the law can be applied better. How about dispute resolution? How frequent are problems like money recovery or insolvency or you know disputes over employment or designs? So would you say dispute? You know, disputes is a very important angle in this for lawyer. Definitely, it definitely is. But what's also interesting to understand is that a lot of these fashion brands or you know people working in the area of fashion are uh, are a little hesitant of approaching courts. To resolve to resolve disputes because of the nature of the works they have, right? So the va- the monetary value of their design might not be a lot, but the creative value or the ethical value of their design might be really high, which is why they usually prefer to settle it out of courts. So knowing skills like negotiations and out of court mediations is extremely important. Arbitration will work only for much much bigger brands, the luxury brands, and if there are issues that come up with it. but because this is a very tight knit community by itself there are not many of many cases that you would hear about as such now um however but this is just within the industry just two weeks ago the delhi high court issued a issued an order for in the favor of christian lobotin as well and this was an in court settlement of an international trademark infringement issue a trademark infringement issue and uh, So I mean, these things are important, but a lot more in terms of frequency is out of court negotiations and settlements that need to happen. But most of these can be prevented straight up by simply, you know, following a basic a basic understanding of contracts and intellectual property um, supply. Okay. So uh, would you describe this industry as something which is already crowded with lawyers? Like, for example, we know financial industry has a lot of lawyers, a lot of law firms working in this area. I, I is is the fashion industry like that? Who are the major lawyers, major players in fashion industry, or major law firms working for the fashion? Like we know media industry, we know there are like you know film industry. You know these are the few law firms which are handling a lot yeah, of. Absolutely. But it's not. It's not so with fashion. We have no idea who are the major players. Yeah. So, like I said, because the fashion industry by as a whole is a little hesitant to reach out to law. depending on the kind of case they have they would reach out to independent to lawyers and law firms that work in the general areas of law and then they apply these laws specifically to the fashion industry anand and anand has been working with uh, fdci i uh, krida legal is working in the area of fashion and dispute within india um khimani uh, and uh, anand and anand and khimani now and associates is working in the celebrity management domain which ends up including models etc as well but internationally there are a lot of law firms working in this area fordham law fordham in fact has a new llm program focusing just on fashion law the queens mary college started with an art business and law llm last year so there is a lot happening but as specific to the fashion industry there are very few lawyers working only in this area it's more of you know we'll see what had what happens and whatever case we get and if that is a fashion specific case we'll do it because we know the law well right so it's not i don't think it's a difficult industry to get into what's important is knowing the industry well to be able to apply the law a- a- adequately say for example in the art industry uh, a basic understanding of insurance is not going to help you understand how art insurance work because the idea of art insurance is completely different in that it's not just recovery of money but it's recovery of that painting that was made if i have an amrita shergill painting and that gets destroyed i don't care how much money the insurance company is giving to me because the painting that was of value has gotten destroyed 
So what happens? Like in that case, obviously the painting, if it is destroyed, it is destroyed. If it has been destroyed by fire, I can't get it back. So Absolutely. how? So how? Like how does art insurance work in that case? So the idea of art insurance is one to enable restoration in case of uh, you know these paintings or the artwork getting spoiled. Uh, of course, if it, if it's beyond repair, then you really can't do anything. It's lost for eternity. But if, say, for example, one part of it has been destroyed, then you try and recover it, or you try and you know use modern methods of bringing it back to as orig- at the original state as possible. Uh, but it, art insurance also works really well in the favor of artists who are trying to build their repertoire and their you know grow their career graph and build an investment value of their artwork because. having that insurance consists it does not cost much and having your artwork insured on a consistent basis keeps getting you an appraisal in terms of market value as well so if if i am interested in uh, you know either art law or fashion law where should i start like how can i learn more about this get to know the industry because obviously in india i am not aware of any courses or any uh, even blog for that matter Absolutely. i'm not aware of a blog where there is which discusses these uh, you know the law from the point of view of the fashion industry or art industry right. so for india i am not aware of anybody who is working like any blog or book that i can recommend you internationally the best place to start with fashion law definitely is the fashionlaw.com and it it's an immense way it's an immense wealth of knowledge that they have a second place to look at in conjunction to that is the business of fashion uh, in india img alliance has just very recently started the voice of fashion which does not discuss legal issues per se by itself but also discusses the business perspectives of fashion and law plays a huge role in that so you can keep checking on these things as well in terms of art it's more mostly about I th- a good place to start for art law would be art history in fact and not art laws specifically because having a bet a good understanding of art history would be- make you better at a- application of the law in the industry itself okay and how is art history going to help a lawyer i mean i'm really curious about that if you can elaborate see as lawyers i think it's extremely important for us to you know look at things from a multidimensional perspective if we just look at the letter of the law and not understand what we are dealing with we won't be able to apply the law well either knowing how art history develops or how art has developed uh, in the recent past will give us an idea of say what value certain kinds of artwork have or how has how is art important for a particular society or what kind of art is important for a particular society um for cultural intellectual property knowing what art form belongs to which area is going to be extremely beneficial for you you to know whether a geographical indicator is possible or not but if you don't know where that artwork comes from what the history of that artwork or that fashion design for example is you wouldn't really be able to ascertain as a lawyer what kind of best legal remedies are possible okay so uh, are there such uh, lawyers in india who actually have that kind of background i'm sure there are but in, how is it that you're going to develop that kind of a background like you're suggesting that you should study art history yes. or, apart so from it, that, where do it, you i know art history is a huge subject like people do master degree in art history how like where does one begin in fact uh, my mentor mr devotam goes who is uh, mr devotam bose who is an international lawyer he's been he's one of the first indians who work in the area of art laws is a, a art history major by himself and he's a lawyer as well he's worked in the areas of project finance but in india and internationally now he gives lectures he works on cases of art history of appraisal of art etc and this is in fact he advised me as well when we met that a good art lawyer should also have a good idea of art history uh, other than that independent lawyers are in fact definitely working it's always better to know art history to be able to a certain art well but a good understanding of technology is extremely important given the kind of art we are dealing with today uh, especially if you want to start looking at newer art forms there's a lot of lot of talk going on about how blockchain can or just general technological uh, development can assist in 
bringing art forward which is what has happened with a, a softwares like photoshop and a, and various other softwares in terms of developing the art scene in india and abroad uh, a good idea of these would be extremely beneficial okay so uh, you know if like what sort of career opportunities are available in this sector if you can throw some light on that because if some obviously if there's a many of our viewers are usually law students or young lawyers who are interested in a career so you know how you know what how rewarding is this career or what is the experience like what are the uh, you know what can one expect if they decide to become a fashion lawyer or lawyer working for the art industry or fashion so the fashion industry is a little more structured than the art industry is for sure with it, if it's a if it's a fashion industry you're looking into with the bigger brands you can always work as an in-house legal counsel you can join law firms or you can start independent practices focusing on representing these uh, designers or brands you can and depending on what area of fashion you want to work into there's celebrity management or model management which also requires lawyers whether it's contract drafting whether it's advisory or dispute resolution there's a, a lot of scope in all of these with regards to art especially because india does not have as much of a regulated market whether it's in terms of development of art or sale of art or in terms of auctions etc there isn't a, a single area that i can you know very authoritatively tell you about but a good place to start would be legal practice in representation and advisory for these galleries or auction houses or independent artists as well for example this is what this is one of the things that i do i i conduct workshops and i consult with uh, independent creative entrepreneurs and freelancers i work on i work with them help them to draft their contracts for the freelance work that they do or in case they are commissioning work outside or they are licensing any of their creations to another brand or another organization then assisting them on these things okay so uh, you know uh, are there companies which deal with like there are obviously large fashion brands so working for them as a lawyer in house lawyer is that an option of course of course so whether it's a louis vuitton or a, so the lvmh group of course has in house an in house legal team which works in these areas there's a lot of dispute resolution that needs to happen or simply because there these are international brands that want to sell all across whether it's in terms of purchasing a store or supplying their products to another country or having vendors ship there is a lot of work happening so all of these big brands especially the ones who are international need lawyers so uh, i understand that international brands have uh, lawyers but they rarely hire indian lawyers full time but aren't like what about the indian brands like in big fashion brands in india are they hiring uh, full time lawyers the uh, img alliance uh, is one of the brands which is one of the big names which brings a lot of international brands to india and these and uh, the img team also has lawyers that assist in negotiations with these brands right so uh, with, so the one the international brands coming to india always come under a conglomerate of an or an industry head which is based out of india and the lawyers have opportunity there second there are a lot of in indian brands that are coming up whether it's in terms of the i mean you see the fashion weeks that happen there are so many brands representing india abroad as well or even within india whether it's the lakme fashion week or the paris fashion week the new york fashion week and all of these might not need a lawyer in house but they definitely need legal assistance okay okay yeah so uh, interestingly why do you think that some of the very big fashion brands which are doing business of 500 crore 1000 crores in in a year how come they don't have a lawyer isn't that a little strange because i know that uh, sabhi sachi i was just doing my research and sabhi sachi as a brand doesn't have a single lawyer in their team so and I, i found that kind of strange what what do you think see i think like i said one uh, because the industry isn't really open to the idea of legal assistance as of now independent designers even if they are big brands in themselves usually hesitate to you know um, get lawyers in house because it's a single man with a team but if it's a brand by itself 
then they are a lot more inclined on getting a lawyer because this is not for them it's more it's a lot more different in terms of business structure as well so that's also we need to at times look at if it's an independent designer who has created a brand by themselves on their own name these would usually have lawyers and who they outsource their work to because they don't really need as of now a lawyer in house they don't have as much work for a lawyer in house for that matter but if it's a if the business structure is completely different if it's a if it's say for example an amazon that is coming out with a brand of them or for themselves or a lifestyle for that matter then they would definitely have a lawyer in house itself okay and how about uh, you know like how does it work when it comes to uh, uh, I, like i have myself come across a lot of people who are you know like people who are doing some work on a contractual basis for all these designers like they are not employees of the designer but they are doing the work and it has been seen that a lot a lot of cases that they are not paid on time okay. and you know there are huge dues like i have come across many such issues where people from the village like they definitely don't have much legal work where with a little not much money getting into trouble over and and it's a significant amount like maybe a whole village works on a certain kind of thing and you know a few crores are due to like you know 100 people and there are one or two people who are managing that work on a contractual basis and they get into trouble so what's happening in this front like you know what like how do they like do these things even go to the court do they even end up come to the lawyers like who who provide help to these people i will divide uh, this answer into two parts the first one being if it's say independent design small time designers or interns working with these brands or bigger fashion houses giving them their designs eventually maybe not even getting paid for it or not getting the recognition due it's extremely important in that front to start developing a culture of a basic understanding of intellectual property now we see in engineering colleges and such co- and you know fields like these where there are l- subjects of law that are being taught specific to this industry even in business schools corporate law and business laws are taught i think it's extremely important for the fashion industry and the fashion schools especially to start looking at adding fashion and understanding of fashion law to their curriculum as well because a basic understanding of in- intellectual property of copyrights of uh design patterns of trademarks is going to greatly assist their students in preventing such issues coming up in the fu- in the future for them uh it's extremely difficult because to get legal assistance in courts for these people because for them it's about it's a trade off you know about how much more they can create for example if they have a design that's already gone and it's already been used and they've not gotten the credit for it they wouldn't they usually don't want to waste any more time on resources on that with regards to smaller communities um uh, we have start i've started working on this project on cultural intellectual property rights initiative uh with monica my friend who's based out of germany uh, she's also a lawyer um, enrolled with the romanian bar the idea is to to understand cultural intellectual property in terms of property owned by a community of people what happens when it's not one person whose idea it is that gets you know infringed but a community's idea in terms of say for example a design that a community has been using has been producing for years and years together it's a generational heritage product that they have and now this gets infringed and a, and some brand comes picks it up and puts it on the uh, international platform and calls it their own there is no credit being given to it and that's the whole idea of cultural intellectual property because in this it's not just a, it's the idea is that the law should be created in a way that it gives back to that community itself and this is something that we need to be working on greatly we are in fact planning a conference and a fashion show next week for next month next year sorry in india focusing on the area of cultural intellectual property rights specifically in the fashion industry and i think it's extremely relevant for us to understand that i mean intellectual property is not just about one person's creativity at times it's also us looking at cultural property coming from a prop, a whole group of people or a society of people right right i think that's a very interesting aspect of 
uh, fashion as well as art. Like there's a, there's more art, there's more cultural art, more uh, you know community based art. Like there are so many amazing forms of art that exist created by communities. Great. Uh, you know, if you can tell us about some of the most important uh, work that you have done at, in this sector, like as a lawyer. Like what are the if I ask you, what are the three most memorable things you have worked on? So, Ramanuj, uh, I wouldn't have as much to add to that because I'm only a five, six month old graduate. But definitely the work I'm doing on the Cultural Intellectual Property Rights Initiative is extremely rewarding in terms of, every, of the things that I'm getting to learn. And also because there is a lot of contribution that I'm, I've been able to make in terms of policy formulation as and when it's going to happen. For um, in terms of personal experience, the workshops that I host are, have been, are extremely rewarding because one, I get to meet people from so many different, by practicing so many different art forms, whether it's, you know, freelancers, photographers, artists, illustrators, body artists, tattoo artists, etc. And just understanding that each of them require a very specific approach to protection of their work has been, has been extremely rewarding. The reason for that is that I'm able to get out of a cubicle mindset as a lawyer and look at things more from a business perspective, more from a strategy perspective and see how best can I make the law work for my clients or the people I consult with instead of seeing this is the law and this is how I'm just going to straight up apply to it. That's not how it usually works because these are all creative industries and they require the law to be applied very creatively to them. How do you go about business development? How do you generate new clients? How do you find new clients? Um, the first and foremost idea for now is to start building up an idea that the law is not something that's going to oppress these creative entrepreneurs or fashion brands, but it's there to assist them, which is why I conduct a lot of workshops. I, I keep writing on my uh, blog as well. And I'm a member of the Fashion Revolution India community. I also volunteer at the Sustainability Style Speak, which is a group of people who work in the areas of fashion sustainability. And that this is where best I get to meet a lot of people who I end up working with as well. So breaking it down, basically the approach is to blog and then be part of communities and doing workshops. So you are working on creating awareness in your area of work so that more people yeah get interested and start taking legal lawyers and law more seriously, right? Yes. That's, that's, okay, that I think that's a, that's if for any new area or for any new kind of work that you do, it's extremely important to continue meeting the right people consistently because networking is important. That's the only way you get your uh, brand out, you get the work you're doing out because if you're inside an office and nobody knows about you, it's not going to work out well. I barely spend any time in office unless... There is actual work to do. Uh, my work is mostly on the go. And my most of the effort that I put into my work goes into meeting new people, continue, continuously following up with them, making sure if I meet somebody new, I put in an email every on a daily basis to remind them that I met them today and I thank them for you know, the time that they we spend. And this is like maybe we should meet ne next week and this is the work we can do together. As I think as law students, this is something I realized that we are taught how to study the law, how to interpret it, but not how to strategize, not people's skills in terms of how to reach out to the right people, or how to network well, or how to develop business well. And it's extremely important for us to understand these things as well as lawyers and law students. Right, that's absolutely true. I'm very impressed by the way that you know you have, I think you have gotten this very right. And perhaps getting it right is very critical for you because you are in such a industry where uh, you know, it, it's a very different industry. Like if you're in, let's say, insolvency or if you're in something else, like, uh, I don't know, even labor laws, things would have been different. But for you, it's, yes. you know, you're trying to build a community, you're trying to uh, build a network, you're trying to be part of people, communities, which I find very, very methodical and very smart uh, in the beginning. Yeah. So, uh, yes. can you tell us a little about your, uh, like, what are the kind of, what are the most difficult challenges you have faced while trying to work in this area? Uh, the biggest challenge is that because I'm extremely new, 
uh, I don't have a law firm experience behind me, given the fact that I've graduated this year. Uh, the bigger brands usually would be hesitant to work with me because I don't have as much to show to them. They wouldn't. They're not aware if I can take up the bigger cases or not. But that's. I think that just happens with time. Anybody starting out independent practice and an independent work with does have ends up facing that. It's the challenges range in the areas of you know meeting the right people or meeting enough people or convincing them that you know they need assistance uh, as lawyers it's not just about you know okay you have a case let's go to the court straight up it's more about building that idea that the law can assist them and how best can legal services be provided to them in some cases it would be about dispute resolution in others it would simply be about making them see the perspective of not a- engaging with dispute resolution at all and maybe you know focusing on building better structures within their organization itself and a better understanding of how the law can assist their work okay so uh, you know do you have any idea about uh, if if like somebody wants to like somebody is in a law college and they want to uh, work on art and i actually got a few messages from people mm. asking me about you know like you know what if i want to do art and fashion law what all things you have suggested some blogs to read already but yes. beyond what is it that people can do find work that's all like i think the best way to work in an area is to find work which means reach out to the right people see who are the lawyers who are already working in this area what is the kind of work you would want to do and i mean if it, if you are absolutely sure of the fashion industry itself then maybe you can also look at being in house uh, counsel for a fashion brand that you get through okay so uh, any 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 sort of lawyers with whom people should consider interning or you know uh, maybe being an apprentice or interning with any lawyer you will recommend in this area Ramanuj right now the this is the biggest issue that we are facing there is no law firm per se working exclusively in this area they might have it on their website that you know they deal in the area of fashion and art as well maybe but there are there is nobody working exclusively in this area these law firms are also experimenting and trying to find out a lot more clients but if it's a very specific area of work Anand and Anand and Khimani in Bombay works uh, greatly in the area of intellectual property, but especially in the area of celebrity management. Miss Priyanka Khimani has been long known to be one of the best people to work with if you want to enter Bollywood as a lawyer. Um, in Delhi, Krida Legal has been doing some great work and representing a lot of designers. Um, Anand and Anand also consults with FDCI. but i'm not i'm not sure of how much work in terms of dispute resolution they've done as of now they're mostly into consulting the ftci as far as i know of it okay so other than that there is no no options much that you know of right? not much yet which is why there's so much more scope in the kind of work we can do if we want to build a niche great so uh, can you give us some ideas about uh, your blog like what what do you blog about and what's the experience of building this blog i i'm very new to blogging it's just been some 2 to 1 and a half months that i've started penning down my thoughts on the fashion and the luxury scene in india i usually happen to write more from a sustainability perspective and how fashion and as an industry can contribute to sustainability given the fact that it has the biggest impact on the environment as well and the kind of and the number of people it impacts but i i mean i'm getting good response however it's limited to the circles that i've been sharing my blogs with whether it's sustainability style speak or the fashion revolution pages so i'm very new to blogging as well just exploring how the world that there is so are you writing about uh, laws or are you writing mostly about sustainability only sustainability from a legal perspective definitely it's also about understanding an understanding of business and law for the fashion brands and for freelancers and creative entrepreneurs it's like a small a quick legal and business toolkit for creative professionals to understand how best to build their businesses for now are you getting all your uh, you know like i i mentioned that you are circulating it in your circles 
But are you getting yeah. your new traffic from there, or are you getting other traffic like Google or somewhere else? For now, I'm getting most of my traffic from the circles that I'm sharing it into. Also, because I'm yet to learn about the technicalities of running a blog. For now, it's just go on to WordPress, write down whatever I have to convey, and post it with some hashtags. I'm still to learn how SEO works best and how I can make use of technology as well as possible. Yeah. and you you have been organizing some workshops and i find this a very uh, interesting method you know i i strongly recommend this to lawyers if they want yeah. to uh, business like doing organizing workshops or speaking at workshops i remember when i was young like you know if if i spoke at one workshop i will at least get one or two clients and that was a big deal back then absolutely absolutely so how do you organize these workshops how do you go about So for now I've been organizing these workshops in collaboration with other art organizations whether it's an art gallery or a collective of artists in fact next week on the 24th I am organizing a talk with Art Buzz which is based out of Delhi itself for the artists that they have on board a quick understanding of the law basics of intellectual property and contracts that these artists can look into and you so usually these workshops are about 2 to 2 and a half hours long and are a quick primer of a very general understanding and what ends up happening is i start getting a lot of queries from these artists as well in terms of how best you know to apply the understanding in their independent practice i think the best way to start off if you are just starting out is to reach out to organizations who already have a big data pool of the kind of people you would want to target because it becomes a lot more easier for you to reach the right people right. and so i think social media is great asking people to share it reaching it's it doesn't take a lot of time to email an organization tell them what you're doing and how you can possibly contribute to the work that they are doing and make it work from there sure i think that's great advice uh if you can tell me a little bit about your like are, do you keep this workshops free or do you charge for them what's the model um the the basic workshops that are more of a primer for about 2 to 2 and a half hours i keep them free because this is general general advice it's uh, it's available on the internet as well if anybody is smart enough to find out put in the effort and read it out but also because it's general advice it wouldn't be applicable to every single person as it as i tell them right for longer uh, training modules that i would have they are mostly paid but it depends on how many number of people are coming in how long the workshop would be like it's all, all of that so there could be say a two day training module on all the laws and business aspects for just for photographers because there's already so much in terms of licensing and intellectual property and model release forms etc that needs to be uh, adhered to great you know interestingly when i was in mumbai this is many years back like you know 7 8 years back we used to do an do a workshop called self defense uh, workshop for creative professionals Mm-hmm. and it was called a self defense workshop but you can understand it was basically a legal workshop self yeah and you know uh, it was basically uh, uh, like we used to teach about contracts like how to draft the contract or what kind of contract they should be entering so that they get paid on time and if they Absolutely. do not get paid on time then what they can do and also a little bit about copyright laws so they can you know how to give take down notices if somebody has copied their content and all and i remember yeah. there were some uh, well known photographers from uh, mumbai and other places used to attend these workshops i think that's a fantastic idea we could not continue doing that later on and we left mumbai also but you know we understand that uh, there are some pockets in this country like for example mumbai has a lot of creative professionals uh, even if you okay. just work for freelancers recovering their dues you pr- perhaps will make a lot of money but uh, like do you think this kind of art and fashion law only is uh, you know concentrated mostly in mumbai and do does delhi have enough work for that matter and how, what about the rest of the country like how about bangalore hyderabad calcutta or other cities is there enough work in this area yeah i think we have lost aruna once more Aruna can you hear me are you there <laughs> well 
Okay, I think we have lost Aruna. <clears throat> Luckily, it is towards the end of the station. It's already eight fifty-six. So uh, we will. Uh, I will say bye to Aruna personally. But thank you for all of those of you who actually attended the session for so long. And thank you very much. Do subscribe to an hour with Law Sico. Today, uh, tomorrow we have a very interesting uh, session on space law. I mean, you know how to build a career on space law, and we look forward to having you uh, tomorrow again. If you have interest in space law or a career in international space law, for that matter, thank you very much. Definitely subscribe to the Law Seeker channel, and hope to catch you another time. Good night and goodbye.